people get saved, we give them John and Romans, gospel, and, and then, of course, Romans explaining about salvation. I find that quite often when I preach, I, I preach a small portion of Scripture. And, and sometimes you don't see the big picture for seeing it so, so close up. Yeah, so we're going to look at a lot of Scripture today. <laughs> That's why I wanted you to have your, your Bible there. Uh, I've never actually attempted a sermon quite like this, but uh, we'll see. Uh, strap, strap yourself in. No, it, it'll be all right. Uh, the, uh, the theme of the book of Romans is the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God. And most people think that the, the key verses would be Romans 1, verses 16 and 17. So let's start by reading those. I'll, I'll read. You follow along. Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The righteousness of God. Aren't you glad that God is righteous? Amen. You know, you read about the beliefs of these false gods, and they have to worry that those false gods will do them wrong. Listen, we don't have to worry about that with the real God. Uh, God is holy. God is good. God cannot lie to us. Uh, aren't you glad we don't have to deal with a, a wicked God? See, the problem between God and man is not God. I can tell you right now, God is not the problem. We are. The righteousness of God is, is a conflict because we're not righteous. We're born not righteous. You know, the Bible tells us that we're, we're born sinners. And Paul, in the book of Romans here, starts with the bad news. Good to get that out of the way first, isn't it? You want the good news or the bad news? Well, we got the bad news first. The bad news is we're sinners. And because of that, we deserve to go to hell. Many people have compared the book of Romans, at least the first half, to a court scene. And at first, he calls out the Gentiles. He, he labels them here in, uh, in verse uh, 16 as the Greeks, the non-Jews. And uh, in, in chapter 1, verse 18, let me read on, on down. Chapter 1, verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, that expression means they suppress the truth. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools." and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. Would you stop reading there? Uh, he, he's talking here, first of all, uh, to the Greeks. And he says, you're sinners. Every person has had an opportunity in history to know God. Now, what I mean is historically there's been twice in history where every person has known the Lord. Adam and Eve, and then after the flood with Noah and his family. And you know, as, as soon as God limited it to people who knew him, man, they, they began denying him and, and moving away from him. One of the things he's talking about there in, in verse 19 are, are the two main evidences of God, our conscience and creation. You know, we read in Scripture that the heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, listen, we can, we can look at creation and see somebody must have made this. And, and many a person, uh, without help of Scripture, has said, whoever you are, I want to know you. And when they... When that's their heart, God sends a person to share the gospel with them. I've heard several testimonies like that of people who, when the missionary or the person talks to them about Christ, they said, I asked God to, to show me. 
and in us, he says in verse, verse 19, God is manifest in them. That's our conscience. You know, everybody has a conscience. Now, not, not everybody has a very good conscience, uh, but we all have a conscience. We're the worst person in the world, there's something they don't think they should do. <laughs> you know? Uh, there's a evidence in us. There's evidence around us. God has showed it unto them as well. And the problem was, when people knew God, they didn't glorify him as God. In verse 21, it says, uh, They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. You know, people live by imagination. Uh, what is it the world tells us? Follow your heart. God says, don't follow your heart. Your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Follow God. <laughs> uh, people don't glorify the Lord. Uh, the Bible says they, they change the truth. Verse 23, they change the glory of the uncorruptible God. They tried to represent him by statues and so on. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature. He's talking about worshiping the creation rather than the creator. Boy, isn't that what's happening today? People worshiping the creation rather than the creator. Now, God says someday this whole world's going to be burned up. He says, and there, then where are we going to be if that's what we live for? Uh, they rejected the knowledge of God. Verse, we haven't re read it, but verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Have you ever wondered why people can do such wicked things? That's, that's exactly the verse that explains it. They've put God out of their mind. They, they, can, they can kill babies. They can, they can do all kinds of things, and they, they think they're doing right. They have a reprobate mind, a ruined mind. Uh, they rejected the knowledge of God. Uh, many people today just consider themselves animals. Well, God says, uh, that's not us. We're made in the, in the image of God. And so as he, he calls out the Greeks, he says, you're sinners. You, you, don't, deserve, uh, you don't deserve heaven by, by who and what you are. And the Jews, boy, they say, yeah, the Greeks, you know, the Gentiles, they're sinners. They should have known. They should, they should be like us, you know, uh, the Jews are saying. But uh, in, uh, in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. Um, verse 17, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. He's talking now to the, to the Jewish side of things. And you know, it, it was real easy for the Jews to say, oh, yeah, we've, we're God's people. We're, we're the ones that the Bible came through, and, and so on. And we're the ones Jesus came through. Uh, it's real easy for them to say, well, God must love us. But listen, uh, God says that Jews are sinners just as much as anyone else. Um, and he says that their judgment, let me read, uh, starting in chapter 2, verse 1 again, their judgment will be, number one, according to truth. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them, which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Isn't that typical of us? You know, uh, Somebody does the same thing we do, and we say, oh, boy, what a rotten person that guy is. Uh, we excuse ourselves, but we don't excuse them. God says he's going to judge us according to truth. There'll be no excuses. Uh, it won't be based on culture. Oh, that's acceptable in our culture. Listen, no, God has a, an, an eternal standard. It's, it's wrong to lie in any culture. It's wrong to murder in any culture, and so on. But God is going to judge by truth. In chapter 2, verse 5, I don't want to miss verse 4. He says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Listen, God's good to everybody. And the purpose is not that we think we're good, but that we repent and come to the Lord. Verse 5, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. God will judge us according to our deeds, our works. And you know what? We all fall short of the glory of God. No one will be saved by doing good works. And yet, if you try it, 
I ask people all the time if they think they're going to heaven. And the, the common answer is, yeah, I think I will. I've been pretty good. But God says no. When we're judged by our deeds, we will fail. Every one of us. The best person in the world falls short of the glory of God. That's, that's what he's saying. He's saying this to the Jews who think, oh, we're good. We're God's people. Uh, down in verse 12, he says, For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. He said, it doesn't matter if you have the law or don't have the law. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or not a Jew. He says, you're all going to be judged the same way, by truth and by deeds. But then the third thing, verse 16 of judgment, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, we'll be judged by the gospel of Christ. God is going to judge us by what we've done with Jesus. I mean, you stop and think about it. I'm a father. I'm a parent. Can you imagine if you gave your child for someone else's life and then they rejected your child? Yeah, that's why John 3 talks about the wrath of God. Uh, listen, when folks reject Jesus, uh, if, the, if that's their eternal decision, they'll face the wrath of God. God gave his son for us. Um, now, the Jews had, had an advantage. Uh, I mentioned it already, verse, chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, we're we're going to look at a lot of verses here this morning. I hope you'll look with me. Chapter 3, verse 1. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly. Now, he's going to list the main one. Because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. It was through the Jews that God gave us the Bible. They had it first. And he said, you have an advantage. I feel like many times Christians are kind of like that. Now, I use that term then in a generic way. There's a lot of people who claim to be Christians. They have, we have Bibles available to us. Man, you can carry it around in your pocket on a computer now. You can have somebody read it to you. Uh, there's no excuse. We've got God's word. We should know the truth. That's what Jesus said to the religious leaders in his day. You know, he'd talk to them and say, you should know this. And as Christians, as, as, I'll quit using that word, as people who have the Bible, we should know the truth. The Jews had an, adv an advantage. But you know, he, he brings it down to this. Jews, Gentiles, were all guilty before God. Look at chapter 3, verse 9. That's the right chapter here. What then? Are we better than they? No in no wise, for we have before, before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, let me read on down almost the rest of the chapter here. Uh, this is a, a terrible description of our, of our sin. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, and their tongues they've, uh, with their tongues they've used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatsoever things, the, I'm sorry, we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. God says we're all sinners. In this courtroom, he brings, you know, Jews, guilty. Greeks, guilty. Bring everybody in. We're all guilty before God. Verse 23, he says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Folks, that's me. That's you. Without Christ, that's us. That's the bad news. Now, here's the good news. Uh, look at chapter, chapter 3, verse 20. He says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there's no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Boy, isn't that good news? Now, you know, uh, before, he, he shows us the bad news. We're all sinners. 
But Christ has come. The Savior has come. And he, he's going to talk quite a bit here about justification, salvation, justification. You know, with a, with a machine, if it's out of whack, you get somebody who justifies it. They bring it back to what it should be. You know, as human beings, without Christ, we're, we're out of whack. We're, we're away from God. We're not right. And God is the one who can justify us. God is the one who can make us right. Um, justification, the word means declared righteous. And you can see as we read there in, in chapter 3, verse 20, it's not by the law. You're not going to be right with God by keeping the law. Um, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. All the law does is show you that you're a sinner. You can't just be good. You stop and think about it. I mean, how good would you have to be? You'd have to be perfect. And man, you blew that years ago. So did I. You know, I blew it before I got out of nappies. <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're just sinners. That's, that's the way we're born. It's not by the law. In chapter 3, verse 22, as we read, it's the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. I love that phrase. It's unto all. Uh, someone has compared it to you know, going to a, a shop and here's a piece of clothing. Unto all. You know, got a price tag. Unto all. When you buy it, it's upon you. You take it home, you wear it. Well, salvation's like that. It's unto all. The price tag is the blood of Christ. But you have to receive it. It's unto all and upon all them that believe. For there's no difference. He's saying no difference between Jew and Greek. For all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. It's through Christ. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Jesus is the way of salvation. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 27, where is boasting then? Let me say this. Religion is basically boasting. I'm talking about the world's religions. It's basically saying, I've kept the law. I've done whatever my religion says. Where is boasting then? God says, it is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And then he goes, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yea, of the Gentiles also. Christ died for the world, not just for one group of people. Christ came for, for every one of us. The good news is Christ has come. He's the justifier. And, and I believe this is the, a real key here. Uh, we're not righteous. We're not righteous. Now, if the problem is we, we think we're good enough. But we're not. God says over and over, and he just, his descriptions are awful, and they're terrible. We're not righteous in ourselves. God is. And there's the conflict. A holy God cannot maintain his holiness and receive us into himself in our unrighteousness. But God has made a difference in that he will justify us. He will declare us righteous by the blood of Christ. When we trust Jesus Christ, he changes us and makes us, gives us his holiness. That, that's the amazing thing about salvation. It's not by works. It's not what we do that saves us. It's what God has done. He'll give us his righteousness. Chapter 5, verse 1. We, we will look at chapter 4, but chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, what a blessing. God will give us his righteousness. Now, chapter 4, God illustrates this in the life of Abraham. Remember Abraham, the, the, the first one that God called and started the, the Jewish line that Jesus would come through? Uh, let me read chapter 4, starting in verse 1. What should we th say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. God says if you could work for salvation... God would owe it to you. It wouldn't be a gift. You could demand it. 
Verse 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And God uses the man Abraham to picture this. See, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. God says justification is by faith, not by works. It wasn't what Abraham did that made him right with God. It was what he believed. And what he believed changed what he, what he did. It's got to be in that order, though. Uh, he was justified by faith. And the interesting thing is, in verse 13, Abraham had not fulfilled the law at, this, at that point. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or, his, or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now, I haven't read the verses, but it talks about how when God made this promise to Abraham, Abraham was not circumcised. Now, the law tells the Jews to be circumcised. But Abraham hadn't been circumcised at that time. It wasn't because he'd done all the things the law said. It was that he believed God. God uses this as a, as a picture. Uh, he, verse 14, if they which are of, of the law be heirs, faith is made voice void and the promise made of none effect. Uh, you see, it's by faith. Abraham had not fulfilled the law, and yet he was, he was justified. He was right with God. See, justification is by grace, not by the law. Look at verse 16 of chapter 4. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. The word grace means a gift. To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. See, if it was by law, well, really, I guess only the Jews could be saved. You know, if you could get saved by keeping the law. Uh, Abraham had not fulfilled the law, and yet he was justified. And when God said he was going to make Abraham the father of a nation, Abraham could not fulfill that in his own strength. Uh, look at uh, verse 19 of Romans 4. This, this is amazing. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Sarah was about 90 years old when they had their first child. My, my dad used to say that the miracle of uh, of that was not just that they had the baby, it was that Abraham lived with a 90-year-old pregnant woman. <laughs> uh, it was an amazing thing. Physically, they, you know, they couldn't just have faith and, and say, well, we'll just, we'll just do it. No, it had to be of God. You, you, you hear people saying, oh, you know, I, I had positive thoughts and I beat cancer. Listen, you won't beat cancer unless God helps you beat cancer. He's the giver of life and health and so on. Abraham and Sarah could not have a child unless God intervened. And this is a picture that God was using. Look at verse 20 of uh, chapter 4. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, what God had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him. Imputed means put to his account. But for us also, verse 24, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. So he uses Abraham as an illustration. Abraham couldn't do it in the flesh. Abraham couldn't do it on, on his own. He just had to believe God. Justification by the resurrection power, not by human effort. Uh, Jesus, Jesus power. And then as you get into chapter 5, you see justification experienced. Uh, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. You know, when a person is saved, God changes things in your life. And the first is your relationship to God himself. When we get saved, justified by faith, we have peace with God. No more strangers, no, no more at enmity with him. Uh, verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We have access to God. You know, the Bible says as a Christian, you can come anytime, all the time to the throne of grace and find grace to help in time of need. We have access to the Lord uh, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, verse 2. Uh, we have hope. Our eternity is taken care of by God's power. 
in, in verse 5, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. When you trust Christ by faith, the Bible says you receive the Holy Spirit. God takes up residence in you. And, and you have the love of God uh, exhibited or experienced, I guess you might say, in your life. Look at chapter 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. <clears throat> for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't die for us because we were good people. Christ died for us because we're sinners. He commended his love toward us. He, he put his love on us. Verse 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Listen to this verse 10. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life. Listen, if, if God would send his son to die for you and, and, and offer you salvation when you're a, you're a sinner, how, how much more is he going to bless you when you, by faith, come to him and you're his child? If that's how God treats his enemies, you know, loving him, giving his son for him, how's he going to treat his children? Uh, what an encouragement that is. Uh, there's the, the blessings uh, of salvation. And the reason, verse 11, not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we've now received the atonement. We've received the atonement. We've been made one with God through Jesus Christ. Um, verse 12, he says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. He, he goes into a whole section here where he talks about how when we're born, we're in Adam. That man, that one man he's talking about in verse 12 is Adam. And we're all related in Adam. We've been talking about this with our Sunday school kids. It doesn't matter what color your skin is, we're all related. We, we all come from Adam, and then we all come from Noah. Uh, we all have the same heritage physically. We need to have the same heritage spiritually. Uh, he goes on, on down in verse 15. He says, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. See, we were in Adam. We need to be in Christ. At Christmas, we sing a, a song where it talks about second Adam from above, reinstate us in thy love. Jesus is the second Adam. He's very different than the first Adam. The first Adam brought us down. The second Adam brings us up, brought us salvation. Verse 18, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now, the question for you today is, are you in Adam or are you in Christ? Very important. And only God can change you from in Adam to Christ. Only God can justify us. It's by faith. Like, you, like we've looked at so, uh, so carefully this morning. It's not by works. It's not by the law. It's not by any ceremony or church. It's by faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. In his death, burial, and resurrection. Are you in Adam or are you in Christ? Jesus called it being born again. Normally when you're born, you're born into a family. Now I know nowadays everybody's so messed up. Now sometimes that doesn't happen. But normally you're born into a family. When you were born physically, you were born into Adam's family. When you get born again, you're born into God's family. Uh, what, a, what a blessing it is. In uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. In 2 Corinthians 5, he says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, old things are become new. Uh, when you're in Christ, uh, that's salvation. And there's even more good news. Uh, chapter 5, verse, verse 80. Let's uh, get back to chapter 5. God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have, we have peace with God. You know, that's salvation. But then he goes on into chapter 6, 7, and 8, and he talks about sanctification. If you want an outline this morning, it's sin, salvation, sanctification. 
And that's what the first, chap first eight chapters of Romans are about. We're all sinners. We all stand condemned before God. But in Christ, there's salvation. We can be justified by faith in the shed blood of Christ. And when we trust Christ as our Savior, he makes our life new. In chapter 6, let, let me read chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now that baptism he's talking about there is not water baptism. He's talking about baptized into Christ. That, the word baptized means immerse. We're placed in Christ when we get saved. And uh, water baptism is a picture of that. Every Christian should be uh, baptized, but when you get saved, you're, you're placed in Christ. And the Bible says, an interesting expression here, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? God says we're, when we get saved, we're, we're dead to sin. Now let me give you three words he gives us here. Bear with me this morning. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. First word is know. You need to know what God teaches. Knowing this, when you get saved, you are crucified with Christ, buried with him, raised to newness of life. That's what he's talking about here, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. First word is no. The second word is reckon. Verse 11, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, what's the difference between reckon and know? Uh, reckon is, is basically to count it as true, faith in action. But let me give you an illustration. There was a man some years ago who used to walk a tightrope over Niagara Falls. He'd get, the crowd would gather around, he'd say, How, who thinks I can walk on this, you know, walk across here? And, oh, yeah, yeah, you can do it. He said, who thinks I could carry someone on my, on my back while I did it? Yeah, yeah, you can do it. Okay, sir, how about you? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> you see, it's one thing to know. It's another thing to reckon. When you reckon, you say, yeah, I'm, I'm in. We need to know what God says, but we need to, it needs to be true in, in our life. Count it as true. And, and the third word, no reckon, is yield. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Uh, we need to yield ourselves unto the Lord. Uh, verse 17, he says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. See, something changes when you get saved. And the change is that God changes you. He justifies you. He declares you righteous. He gives you his Holy Spirit. Uh, your standing before God is changed. It's no longer you're unrighteous and he's righteous. You have his righteousness. And you're acceptable to God. Not by what you've done. Now he warns us very carefully. Uh, we don't sin just because God makes us, uh, makes us forgiven. God has changed us from the inside out. And there's a new problem, by the way. That's what chapter 7 is all about. Uh, you've spent your lifetime living in sin and, uh, and the flesh, and all of a sudden you have the Holy Spirit, and uh, you have a, a new life in Christ, and, man, there's a, there's a conflict now between the flesh and the spirit. Before you get saved, you don't have that. You know, you, you're dead spiritually. But when you become alive spiritually, all of a sudden... That, that begins to conflict with what you're used to doing. And God has to change, change us to, to be like Jesus. In chapter 7, he, he talks about how we're, we're dead to the law, verse 4. Uh, you're, you're also become dead to the law by the body of Christ. And uh, he says in, in chapter 6, verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. But you know what? Our old man, our, our selfish being, we like to keep the law. We like to say, yeah, I'm, I'm better than you. And so there's a conflict. We have to humble ourselves 
and to trust the Lord. You know, God, God says in Romans chapter 7 and verse 18, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I find most people don't believe that verse. To be honest with you. God says, I know that in me that is in my flesh. Now, he's not just talking about your body. He's talking about your sinful nature. Dwelleth no good thing. We think, yeah, I'm pretty good. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. God says we need to know, we need to reckon, we need to yield. And there is hope. Look at verse 24. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And to me, this is one of the shortest answers you'll ever hear. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who's going to help me? Lord, who will help me? Jesus. Jesus will help you. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, he's taken up residence in you. He'll help you. He says, so with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Chapter 8, there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You see, even though there's this problem, there's, a, there's help. God has given us his Holy Spirit. We're alive in the Spirit when we've trusted Christ as Savior. Verse 2 of chapter 8, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, we don't have to live anymore under the law of sin and death. We have a new law, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Let me give you three things and more. Man, I've given you lots of material this morning. I was thinking as I was preparing this, that this is too much. I'm going to give you too much this morning. That's all right. Number one, there's no condemnation. If you're saved... God says there's therefore now no condemnation. You need to understand that. Uh, do you remember chapter 3, verse 20? He said, therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law condemns us. God says we're not under the law anymore. There's therefore now no condemnation. Uh, chapter 8, uh, verse, let me keep reading here a little bit. Verse uh, 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. What that's saying is the problem wasn't the law, the problem was us. We couldn't, we couldn't handle it. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. God fulfilled the law. God has, has made the difference in us. There's no condemnation. Secondly, there's no obligation to the flesh. Look at verse 12. Therefore, brethren, you are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. As Christians, we're not obliged to the flesh anymore. Uh, verse, uh, where am I here? Verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the, they're the sons of God. Our obligation is, is no more to the old master. We died to that. We have a new master. No condemnation, no obligation. Thirdly, no separation. Verse 16, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Listen, God has a place prepared in heaven for you if you're saved. That's our hope. That's his plan. God has a place. That there's no separation. Glory awaits us. Now, we've seen some bad news this morning. All of sin that comes short of the glory of God. But we've seen some good news. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says only God can justify you, make you right with him. God is righteous, we're not. For us to be right with God, we have to be justified by faith, through grace. God does it as a gift. And when he does that, uh, the Bible word is he sanctifies us. He changes us. He makes us like Jesus. And he begins the process of, of our, our position before God when we get saved is we're, we're in glory. Our walk is that we're, we're stumbling around down here. Christians do wrong. Christians make mistakes. Christians sin. And God is gradually changing us to what we'll be when we get in glory. And what a blessing it is as the Lord graciously works with us. You know, he asked some questions there in chapter 8, verse 31. 
And I think this is a question you need to consider. What should we then say to these things? Listen, what are you gonna, what's your response going to be to this? If God be for us, who can be against us? Listen, which side do you want to be on? You want to be for God or against him? I can tell you who's going to win that battle. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Listen, if God would give you Jesus, what good things are he going to withhold from you? Don't live for the things uh, that are temporary here. Live for eternity. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Listen, God says there's therefore now no condemnation in Christ. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that's risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? What a blessing it is to see that God has made a way for us, us to know him. And he makes a statement there in verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. That's our standing with the Lord. Uh, Romans chapter 1, right through to verse 8, he presents salvation. And, and if you'll uh, believe what God says here, he says he'll change you and, and make you his child. Uh, what a blessing that we can come by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I hope this morning that uh, I know I've given you too much. Uh, I don't often do this, but I usually preach short sermons, but I reserve the right to preach long sermons. Uh, uh, we're all born sinners. We need to be born again. What about you? Are you saved? Do you know Christ is your Savior? Has there been a time in your life when you've said, Lord, I, I can't do it myself. Uh, I see that I'm a sinner. I see that I've wronged you. I see that I constantly wrong you. Lord, please save me. I, I believe that your son Jesus died for me and was buried and rose again. Lord, I believe. Please save me. And God promises, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he can't lie. Let me encourage you this morning. I've, I've experienced it. Many of you have. Uh, you've trusted Christ as your Savior. It doesn't make you a, a perfect person in your actions, but it makes you right with God. And that's the start. That righteous God who reached down in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. You can know him. Uh, we're going to close with a, a word of prayer and, and then a, a song. Now, I want to encourage you. Uh, know the Lord. Know the Lord. This is God's word. And uh, we've come pretty close to just, just presenting God's word this morning. Hard, uh, tried real hard not to make many comments. Uh, and God's word is true. Let, let's go to him in prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, we don't understand everything, but some of this was pretty simple. And Lord, we can understand. We can see in our own lives that we're sinners. And Father, without you, we're, we're lost sinners. I pray if there are those here this morning that are not sure about eternity, that Lord, they would trust you today. Lord, by faith, that they would call upon your name as, as Lord and Savior. God, help, a, help us as Christians to see that uh, you've changed us and that there's no condemnation and that there's hope in you. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.